This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I bet a lot of you are going to be familiar with our two guests. We're joined in studio by Alan Mendenhall. Alan is an attorney, also a, a Ph.D. He runs the Blackstone Center at uh, Faulkner Law School right here in Alabama. Uh, Brian McClanahan is a professor, a historian, also a Ph.D., and his latest book is called How Alexander Hamilton Screwed Up America. Uh, I, I guess you especially focus on the founding period and the founding fathers in American history, so we have two guests who are very well equipped to, uh, to talk about the Constitution today. And what I'd especially like to talk about from sort of a devil's advocate perspective is uh, how libertarians should think about and view the Constitution and whether we should consider it a libertarian document that's that's been worthwhile or not. So we're going to get into some history. We're going to get into some jurisprudence and uh, and hopefully get to the bottom of this, if that's possible, in, in a brief podcast. Um, speaking of devil's advocacy, let me throw out sort of initial question. A lot of libertarians are not big on the implied social contracts, and I would consider myself amongst them. They say there's no such thing. The Constitution attempts to be sort of an express written contract of sorts, but the two big libertarian objections are, of course, one, not too many people at the time signed it, a relatively tiny percent of the then existing colonial population, and two, uh, you cannot uh, draft a valid contract that binds future generations. So with those two sort of broad objectives in, in mind as parameters, give us both of you your, your sort of overarching thoughts about whether in general the Constitution has been a, a, a libertarian document. I'll let you go first, Dan. Okay, sure. Well, I think Rothbard's position on this is that the Constitution was a noble experiment, but ultimately I think he called it an abysmal failure. Mm. Uh, the reason being that many violations of individual liberty had occurred under the constitutional system, which means that the U.S. Constitution – either failed in preventing those violations or otherwise gave those violations the stamp of constitutional approval and therefore mm -hmm. legitimized or validated those violations. Um, the Constitution is the longest surviving charter of its kind as one of those sort of uh, byproducts of 18th century thought um, and uh, that, that emanated from social contract theory. So, I mean, I don't personally think that uh, its longevity is a necessarily a measure of of its success by by any means, but uh, but there are areas within the Constitution, um, say the First Amendment, we do mm -hmm. still care about freedom of speech and 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 freedom of association, and we do uh, we do worry about these ideals. Um, the Constitution was designed to enshrine principles of liberty, um, principles such as uh, the separation of powers and uh, checks and balances. And these are good things, I think. And, uh, and I do think we have, uh, we have a, lot of, a lot of residual respect for, for that sort of stuff. And uh, even though the breakdown in the separation of powers seems to be almost complete at this point, right. we still have a notion that those are good things. Okay. Brian? Well, I think there's some things to think about the Constitution when you when you think about the construct of the Constitution. First and foremost, it's a when you talk about a social contract, this is this is a document that was between the people of the state. So it created a federal structure. So when we talk about this thing as a as a document that created a national environment, it really didn't. Uh, and I know there was some discussion about that and many of the founding generation were nationalists, but when you look at Article 7, for example, it says this is a this is a constitution between the states that are ratifying the same. And when you talk about this idea that very few people signed it, that's true, but it was ratified in popularly elected conventions. So the people did have input into it, the people of the states. And when you look at the constitution, you try to find meaning. You look at those ratifying debates. You look at the, at the pamphlets and essays that were written at the time. This is what they said it meant. And so – uh, I think when you start talking about this overarching structure where it's some type of national document, that's, that's, that's getting beyond what it was. In fact, I could make the case the original constitution died in the Washington administration. And that's, you know, when I, <laughs> with the book, you know, I, with Hamilton, that, that's, that's my point. You know, Hamilton went in and lied in 1788 and then undid everything he said that was going to happen when the constitution was ratified once he was secretary of the treasury and had some input in the government. So, uh, 
Uh, as far as it's, it's, if it's a libertarian document, no, it's really a frame of government between states. And I actually believe it is, it is a contract. And so that's why I argue that you can legally secede from it if you want to as a state. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I, the Bill of Rights was not intended to be applied to the states. I mean, there's so many things that, we, that conceptions of the Constitution that we have that are just invalid. And I think that's the greatest problem with the Constitution. We, we believe it, it is what it, it, it isn't. Uh, and, and I think that's where we get into these issues that we're going to talk about today. Well, elaborate a little bit on the Hamiltonians and how there was a tension from the beginning and how the Hamiltonians screwed up uh, things from the get-go. Right. So, uh, you know, when Hamilton was arguing, first of all, 1787, June of 1787, he makes a speech in the Philadelphia Convention, very famous speech. Forrest McDonald actually said it turned the tone of the convention. Well, it that's a lie because nobody really – I mean people thought oh, it was a great speech, but nobody acted on it. Acted on it. So Hamilton wanted things like an, an elected king. Uh, he wanted senators for life. He wanted to reduce the states to corporations. He actually used that term. And so once the constitution was written, finalized, and then voted on, of course goes to the states, then we have these ratification debates. And in those debates, Hamilton becomes a whole different person. He starts saying, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean all those things. In fact – it, at Poughkeepsie in, in New York, uh, he made a very famous speech where he started talking about, I believe in the states. And John Lansing of New York actually called him out on this and said, no, wait a second. And just a year ago, just one year ago, you said you wanted to reduce the states to corporations. And so now you're saying they're vital. Well, I, I didn't say that. He says, oh, yeah, you did. So they, there's this big argument that takes place, almost leads to a duel. And this is one of the stories that I bring out in the book that nobody really knows about. Uh, but Hamilton was lying. And of course, he lied as an author of the Federalist Essay. So when he gets in the general government, he starts acting the way he would have if he had gotten what he wanted in June of 1787, uh, advocating implied powers, uh, advocating a presidency that had much more power than what he said it would have in Federalist 69. So when you look at the Hamiltonians, what they did was basically say, yeah, I know we said all these things, but we want we really want these things. We want we want a president that has almost unlimited power. We want a Congress that can do anything it wants. Uh, and, and we don't really care if there's the states have any any objection to this or not. It does. It's irrelevant because what we need is a strong central government. And that in, in Hamilton's mind, and there is this argument, libertarians are like Hamilton. Well, that would preserve liberty. That was the point. We'd have the strong central government to preserve liberty because the states can run roughshod all over all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, uh, that was the exact opposite of what they said they would do when they ratified the Constitution. There was a lot of concern about the strong central authority and that it was going to destroy the states and the people of the states being able to govern the way that they saw fit for their own political community. Well, maybe that duel should have happened. Maybe we'd be, maybe we'd <laughs> Earlier, be looking right? at things differently. <laughs> we but, might have a different musical. <laughs> but I, I think your point is valid. Rothbard makes this point, but also Lysander Spooner made this point. And I think it goes to when you say the failing of the Constitution is, is sort of our failure a couple hundred years later to understand it for, for what it was. That's right. And, and so in that sense, uh, it, it hasn't endured in, in, in its original uh, meaning or its original purpose. But... Um, uh, on the other side, you know, there are groups out there today calling for a new constitutional convention, which is authorized in, in Article 5. And I think most libertarians rightly are terrified of this prospect because things could be a lot worse, right? We could get together and, and social justice warriors and progressives and even a deluded uh, uh, neoconservative right wingers could get together and create – uh, new constitutional, amend constitutional amendments that are much worse than what we've got. So, so that implies or argues that there there is some libertarian value to it. Well, I think that if if it were an Article Five convention of the states, the states are generally much further to the right than the federal government. So, if it were an Article Five convention of the states, controlled by the states, I mean, we we don't know how, as you say, we don't know how this would play out. But uh, I do think that um, having the states give that end around, um, I, I, I would I would imagine it wouldn't be, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's one of these things that both the left and the right are, you know, have their advocates and have their proponents. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not as pessimistic and afraid of the Article Five Convention of the states as maybe some other people are. Um, but I don't know, Brian. You may have a, a different. No, I actually think it's a it's a pretty good idea uh, because of your your point. You know, the states look. I had a friend say, we, "What we need to do is repeal and replace Washington D.C. Why not just repeal? I mean, forget about replace, just repeal." Um, 
the, the states can do that. It actually puts all the power back in the states. Just even talking about this, we're starting to recognize federalism. And I think that's such a beautiful thing because so long we've talked about, no, I mean, the general government has all this power mm-hmm. and this, this national structure. But now when we start talking about the states being able to go in and change this thing. And I think your point, you know, if you look at what some of the amendments that we might get out of, out of, yeah. out of this and some of the things that have been proposed, we have much more – conservative, libertarian-leaning states than we do. I mean, California only has one vote in that process, right? So how much damage could they actually do? If you took the states that would actually want an SW, SJW situation, it's going to be a fraction. We're going to have more states that are going to say, no, we don't want all that garbage. Let's get rid of some of these things. And you could get some neoconservative influence. I think that would be the most dangerous part because so many conservatives and libertarians are – I mean, our side is, is, is unfortunately – the minority in that group. And so that would be a danger. But I think overall, it's it's a beautiful thing to start talking about the states in this regard again and what the states can actually do to that general government. They could they could abolish the executive branch. They could abolish the Supreme Court. I mean, they could do all kinds of things that, that we would say, well, yeah, let's, let's do it. Uh, and well, I think that would be a, a great discussion to have. But to your point, we, we don't have, you know, we don't have the the same sort of educated leaders that we may have had in the founding era that that's would true. be leading it. So you would. So well, that's I, that's I what concerns that me is that most people are so constitutionally infirm that the people we send to this process would be the same people who right now go to your local zoning meeting on a Tuesday night, right. uh, or who run your HOA. Uh, that's my concern. <laughs> so I'm going to have to disagree with these two august gentlemen and say I think it's a terrible idea. <laughs> um, but it, it's interesting that it took Trump to get our friends on the left to start talking about federalism again. That's right. And, uh, and I was very pleased to see Angelo Cotavilla at Claremont, who is you know a neoconservative guy but a serious scholar, not a partisan hack, um, give some g- sort of grudging respect to the idea of sanctuary cities and saying, you know, maybe this is the way we've got to go. Um, I think that's fleeting, though. The left is only going to subscribe to this so long right. as they're not in power. Right. Once they're back, and same, the right does it too. Right. Once they're out of power, they're oh yeah, we love right. federalism. Once they're in power, no, no, we don't like that. Let's let's. <laughs> well, I think I think the 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 right has embraced federalism because it it suspects correctly that it's losing, it's losing culture wars certainly. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the the original document. I'd like to move on to what was at the time sort of an addendum, the Bill of Rights. Interesting that George Mason refused to sign the Constitution, and, and even the Bill of Rights wasn't enough to to allay his concerns. Um, I don't like the Bill of Rights. I, I think the incorporation doctrine has been bad for liberty. Uh, but I'd like I'd like both of your thoughts on the, on the Bill of Rights and and whether you know a document uh, the document itself within the four corners should have been tighter, uh, and our our understanding of federal power should have been. Uh, robust enough that that a Bill of Rights wasn't necessary. Well, I incline more toward the anti-federalist position. It was the anti-federalists who wanted to include a Bill of Rights. And uh, the Federalist's concern was that if you enumerate these rights, then you potentially leave out other rights. And by specifying which rights are there, you risk saying, OK, anything that's not there is, is, is not there. Um, but what I, I guess my – where I have a problem is is not necessarily with the Bill of Rights but as you say, it's incorporation against the states and that's done through the 14th Amendment and uh, I find that to be problematic and I know that uh, many libertarians disagree with me on that point. But uh, it's my view that we ought not to empower the federal judiciary to be making these determinations about rights, defining rights for us. Um, in many cases, inventing rights. I heard a commentator mm-hmm. on the radio recently talking about, you know, trying to discover these rights, uh, rights to subsistence, rights to basic income, rights to um, th- these kinds of things. And, you know, <laughs> you can't discover those things in the 14th Amendment. They're just, it's, you know, that, but the, so the, I tend to think that the incorporation against the states is 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 a bad thing for liberty, um, and I, I think Brian agrees with me on that. Absolutely, point. and uh, in fact, in in the Hamilton book, the last chapter is on Hugo Black, who is you know the, the main villain in incorporation. Um, but uh, the Bill of Rights is an interesting document. First of all, most people don't understand the preamble to the Bill of Rights ex- expressly explains what these things were there for. They were restrictive clauses on the general government only, and so uh, when you look at the Bill of Rights. 
This is the problem with it. They think, well, you know, if if my if I am given a a red light ticket in my city, I'm going to I'm going to uh, go ahead and file a suit in a federal court to take care of that. Well, that's completely backwards. You know, you, you, <laughs> this is in your city government, but we think that these rights, well, these are my rights, are codified there. But as Alan points out, it's federal judges who have created all this mess and the Fourteenth Incorporation of the Fourteenth Amendment. One thing I want to say about you know the Bill of Rights and anti federalists and Federalists in those terms, I actually hate those terms because we had proponents and opponents of the Constitution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The the anti federalists were the real Federalists. The Federalists were the Nationalists, and so I mean I think that's when that language kind of skews what was going on here. And also Mason didn't just refuse to to sign the Constitution; he would rather cut off his right hand than sign the Constitution. <laughs> that's that's a much more powerful statement. I don't want to. I'm not going to cut off my hand if I have to sign this thing. Uh, but you know the Bill of Rights. Um, I think you know, as far as uh, the argument, as Alan pointed out, Roger Sherman said, you know, well, if we have a Bill of Rights, then if we don't put any everything in it, then we're going to create problems because then some rights are not going to be there. So that's what the Ninth Amendment was for. Um, but I think the the real issue with it is not the Bill of Rights itself, but the incorporation of the Bill of Rights that we, that we bristle at the most uh, when we start talking about these creation of, of you know guaranteed income or you know, right to food or right to clothing or whatever we want to talk about today that we say my God, but there's no way that's that you can even find that there but that's that's the real issue if we applied it only to the general government and said these are restrictions on the general government only which is what it was designed to do I think it's actually a very good thing uh, in, in that regard uh, because it would stop if if you believed in it. I mean you can't hold it up as a shield you know but if you believed in it and people believed in it right it would stop right. some of the abuse of power that we right. can see in Washington you know but again, this this what I consider unfortunate um, libertarian fetish for nationalizing things, mm-hmm. because we might imagine there's an ill libertarian result at a state or local level. I, I mean, call me a simpleton. I, I read the first amendment says Congress shall pass no law, and, and the Scalia types are always uh, ventilating about uh, textual plain meaning. I, I don't see how you can possibly say, regardless of the Fourteenth Amendment. That, that the First Amendment has any bearing on whether UC Berkeley allows Milo to come speak. I think UC Berkeley should allow Milo to come speak, and the California Constitution may well require that. Mm-hmm. But I, it says Congress shall make no law. How does that apply to states under any coherent uh, interpretation doctrine? I thought you were going to take this. <laughs> oh, one. I can do that. Hey, uh, okay. <laughs> I, have, I have a very hey, short Mr. answer. Lawyer. <laughs> I got a very short answer. You got me, right? Yeah. I mean, this, is, this is, but this is the problem with it. Of course, Black uh, in the 1960s came up with this idea that uh, John Bingham, who was the who was the author of the 14th Amendment, um, that they firmly believed that, that incorporated the Bill of Rights against the states, or you know, you you could apply it against okay. the states. And the, if you read those debates at that time, and Raoul uh, Berger actually has a very good book on this, Government by Judiciary. But if you read the debates, what you find is that the Republicans in the Congress at the time had a very interesting conception of, of the Bill of Rights. They said it was already incorporated against the states because it's part of the Constitution. The Constitution works against the states. And so mm-hmm. it's already part of it. And, and so at the time, people said, wait a second here. Didn't Baron v. Baltimore uh, go against that? Oh, yeah, you're right. But, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, so I think when you look at the intent of the 14th Amendment and when you finally get that thing through the Congress – the intent was pretty clear. It wasn't supposed to apply to the states, but Black made it happen uh, for, I think, nefarious reasons. You know, he was trying to prevent Catholics from having any type of religious liberty, uh, but um, or you know, have to be to be able to, be able to uh, use state funds for busing and you know, schooling and things like that. And he was very anti-Catholic. Um, but I think that you know, the, the fact is, um, there's no way if you look at the historical record, you can conclude that the 14th Amendment should have applied the Bill of Rights to the states. It's just – it's it's a stretch to say the least. Well, yeah, I I, I agree with Brian on that point and uh, I find it very problematic that you would want to empower federal judges. Keep in mind that these are people that graduate from our American law schools mm-hmm. and get th- go through that type of legal education process. And these are very illiberal thinkers as far as, you know, non-libertarian. They're not necessarily liberty-friendly people and that you would want to vest them with all these powers over states. And I find that to be just a wrong a wrong move from the get-go. Right, right. Well, how hard would it be to say neither Congress nor the respective states shall in, in our – in, you know, in other words, amend the First Amendment. We haven't done that. 
We could do um, it through an Article 5 convention of the states. We could do it through an Article 5 <laughs> convention. Uh, so while we're still on the topic of the 14th, it's a, a bit tangential, but the, the due process uh, rights language contained in both the 5th and 14th Amendment do mention property. Mm-hmm. Now we haven't uh, we haven't stuck to that too well in the post Lochner era, and and people who who uh, follow Judge Napolitano, who will be here at Mises U this coming week, know about the Lochner decision and, and economic substantive due process. You can go look that up on your own. But but um, we haven't respected property uh, in our federal courts the way we've respected life and liberty. Uh, but the fact that the founders wrote the word property in there is that is that uh, does that. Uh, uh, go to the uh, the the balance side that of of uh, their libertarian bona fides. Well, it's actually the Fourteenth Amendment has been used to actually cut against private property rights. I mean, if you look at you, if you're trying to find state action, you can find it, and there there are uh, examples of federal courts finding state action by private businesses that that are looking. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's an issue of whether the government's going to prohibit say. D- discrimination against some suspect class, it's, you know, whether it's race, gender, whatever it is. And it raises big questions about whether private businesses ought to be able to do that and whether um, and whether there is any kind of state action that would allow the federal government to come in there and control the activities of private businesses. And that does implicate property rights, but not in the way of preservation, but in the way of destruction of those property rights. Um, because you have small businesses at risk of, um, of, of all these accusations under under federal law, mm-hmm. that uh, that federal law really shouldn't be touching. Right. Absolutely. Uh, do Do you think due process is held up a couple hundred years later, um, property or otherwise? That's a very good question. I think just piggybacking on what what Alan said, you know, when you look at this idea of property and w- what's happened through through the 14th Amendment is that people now have become the state. And I, that's, I think that's a hard, hard concept for people to understand. But if I am – and this was actually pointed out in, in um, uh, the, the 19th century um, where there was a dissenting opinion where the uh, Supreme Court justice said, well, look, what you're doing here is saying that – I believe this is in the slaughterhouse cases. You, you might – I'm trying to you know, think here. But uh, where there was a dissenting opinion that if you, uh, if you do this, uh, if you say that uh, you can't discriminate – because you are, uh, you own this. Pro- you're making someone an agent of the state. So, mm-hmm. uh, for example, if I walk from from Alabama to Georgia, I've just committed interstate commerce because I am now the state. But that's not that's not what the the, the intent was in all of these things. And and uh, we we have this very strange concept of state action now and who is the state. And and I think the Fourteenth Amendment has done that. Uh, when you look at um, you know, due pro- you're asking about due process. We have different. There's there's procedural due process, which is not something we really believe in anymore. Now it's it's substantive due process, so it's preventing state action. But that's not what due process actually meant. I mean, when you look at the founding generation, what they were concerned about was procedural due process. Did someone follow all the proper procedures to be deprived of their life, liberty, or property, and not just to uh, you know say we're gonna we're gonna do these things to prevent any of this stuff from happening. So. Um, we have to understand what due process actually meant in the 18th century, rather than uh, you know what we want it to mean or what we think it should mean. Because when you when you get away from procedural due process, you can create all kinds of nasty little problems, as Alan just talked about, uh, when it comes to private property rights. Well, Alan, I'd like to shift to the idea of judicial review, found nowhere in Article Three, by the way, <laughs> That's in the right. judicial power. We're not in there. Marbury versus Madison comes along, and we get this concept uh, that. That seems to me uh, it made the Supreme Court not only supreme over lower federal courts, but supreme over the other two branches of government. Uh, constitutional jurisprudence is not the Constitution. Are, are we living under some sort of ersatz um, constitutional jurisprudence at this point that is uh, rather than the Constitution itself? The answer is yes. And uh, I want to qualify that answer by by backing up to the separation of powers again. So under Mon- Montesquieu's conception of the separation of powers, you have an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. The executive branch enforces the law, the legislative branch makes the law, and the judicial branch interprets the law. And under that scheme, 
if any one branch arrogates to itself powers belonging to the other branch, then political liberty has become non-existent in, in that state. You, it, it really is a system whereby each branch is a check on the other. Now, judicial review um, is not in the Constitution. Mm-hmm. And quite frankly, even in Marbury Ma- versus Madison, it's not in there in the way that we talk about talk about it today. Um, and uh, and basically, judicial review is a is a product of these 18th century constitutions because historically, judicial opinions were well. Let's put it this way: Sir Matthew Hale, a 17th century jurist, William Blackstone. Uh, 18th century jurists, they talked a lot about judicial opinions as if they were lex non scripta, unwritten law. Uh, the common law is generally traced back to the 12th century under Henry II's rule, and uh, opinions were issued orally. And, uh, and then from the 13th to the 15th century, some opinions were transcribed in French and, and put mm-hmm. put in, compiled in yearbooks. And then 15th and 16th century, you had some lawyers writing down opinions, like writing them down. So they're transcribing. Imagine taking notes verbatim in a classroom. You can't do it. So the, these are just opinions written down loose hand. Um, but you do have this, uh, this establishment of the idea of precedent, stare decisis, that precedent will be um, – will have the authority of law and lawyers are citing cases uh, as authority in courtrooms. Um, but even, uh, even when uh, Sir Edward Cook wrote Institutes of the Laws of England, he um, – you know, there were at, at that point there were no court reporters. There, you know, cases weren't being indexed in an official corpus, or um, really? you know, written down in a digest. No, this is. I think that the idea of um, that basically that opinions, written opinions, are an American innovation, and that they have something to do with the fact that we have a written constitution. That there was a felt need to write down these opinions. Um, now, when we first, after you know, at, let's we're talking about you know around the time after the Judiciary Act of 1789, our justices are still issuing seriatim opinions. So each one is writing an opinion, each justice, and that makes it very difficult to discern what the law is from the case. I actually kind of like it because there's no majority to, opinion. Well, you, you, you there, there, yeah, there's no, there's not, no, there's not somebody writing for the court. For, okay. But you would find you'd have to you know hold the opinions side by side and figure out where uh, they where they uh, connected, where they disconnected, what to just figure out like what happened in this case. It was really hard. Um, I think that would be a good thing to make the justices a little busier so that they can't do as much do as much damage now. But uh, but uh, the idea that the Supreme Court's opinions constitute law is a c- complete collapse of the separation of powers. Courts cannot make law. An opinion is just that. It is an opinion about the state of what the law is. I mean, Ed Meese has an interesting law review article. Um, I believe it was in the Loyal, Loyal Law Review um, where he's talking about Cooper v. Aaron. And uh, he says basically, um, you know, a, 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 a legal opinion is not on par with the Constitution itself. If it were, the, the U.S. Supreme Court could never overrule itself because – you know, it would just be up there pronouncing laws that were, um, you know, immaculate and perfect. But uh, but uh, opinions were traditionally treated as evidence of law that that would bind the parties to the case. And if that law were going to apply in inferior courts, then the inferior courts would have to look to Supreme Court precedent and incorporate that position within their own decisions. But it didn't just automatically, the minute the U.S. Supreme Court issued a ruling, apply always and everywhere and just bind right. everyone. You know, right. you, the, it was instruction to the lower courts and evidence for the lower courts, but it was just not automatically the law of right. the land. The Constitution is the law of the land. The body of cases that interprets the Constitution is what we call constitutional law, but it is always supposed to be subject to the Constitution. Well, when you talk about... The, the this American concept of writing down legal opinions, I, I guess I wasn't aware that that was sort of a peculiarly American notion. But Judge Napolitano talks about this sort of organic process of discovering common law versus positive law I- enacted by legislatures. And it sounds like we have a legal positivism as well, where we're, where courts are writing down things and and they're not they're they're creating precedents. Uh, that apply 
bizarrely across different fact patterns even yeah, in the I, underlying case. I think we've struggled from the beginning to incorporate the common law tradition into a constitutional system uh, okay. of federalism with states and a national government. It's been an uneasy fit to say the least. I mean, the idea of the common law being this organic process that is bottom up, rooted in custom and tradition, whereby, you know, the rules are uh, antecedent to any government promulgation and they sort of trickle up into the political institutions um, has not really been easy to square with a system whereby a constitution, which is necessarily bottom down, mm -hmm. is um, is setting the parameters and uh, and uh, controlling the institutions within its prescribed jurisdiction. I mean, the interesting okay. thing about all new constitutions is that they're they're necessarily unconstitutional because there's no it, they don't derive from a pre-existing constitution that authorized their creation. It's right. kind of an interesting thing to right. think about. But well, well, Brian, getting back to the the structure of the document, the original intent behind it. Um, Article 1, Section 8 was supposed to rein in Congress and say, look, this document isn't authorizing you to do things. It's, it's, it's on the contrary. It's, it's constricting you. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is listing a few express powers. Mm -hmm. um, as you well know, virtually every law Congress passes exceeds the bounds of Article 1, Section 8, at least from our perspective. It's, it's extra constitutional. Mm -hmm. Isn't that another way of saying illegal? Is the Constitution black letter law? Uh, I believe so. Uh, but again, you have to find – and this is where I go back to the ratification debates. You have to find the meaning out of that. And this is what James Madison said. Look, the only thing that gives the Constitution meaning are these debates and what people said it was going to mean when it was going to be ratified. And one thing going back to judicial review for a second, they actually did talk about it. And I think there was, there was some mm, – my marshal said this. I think that, that the Supreme Court will – have a judicial review type of system. And there were others that made these points too in Connecticut and other places. So uh, the first time we actually had a judicial review process was 1791 and Hamilton was behind that too. It was it was Hilton v. the United States and, and he argued for the United States and the, the Supreme Court found the law constitutional. They didn't invalidate it. So uh, this was something that was actually openly discussed. The problem is though that the appeal from the – you can appeal a state court decision to the federal court system. That was – that's the real issue. And I think that when you talked about the Judiciary Act in Section 25, that was the one that everyone criticized because you could go right from a state and appeal right to the federal government. And that's the – that's what I was talking about before. I get a speeding ticket in Alabama and then I just say this is unconstitutional. I'm, I'm going to go appeal to a federal court. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean this – but the Judiciary Act allowed that to happen. So – um, but when you look at Article One, Section Eight, you look for meaning. One of the important phrases in Article One, uh, Article One, is that all the powers herein are granted. Now, who's doing the granting? Well, the states are obviously and the ratifiers. That's right. And so the people of the states. And so a granted power. If I was to grant you the power, if we were in a classroom, and I said, uh, Jeff, I'm going to give you the power to grade your own tests. And so, OK, I'm going to grade my tests. I get it all back and they're all 100s. And I start looking at it and say, well, you made some mistakes here. So I'm going to rescind that power. I'm going to take that back because obviously you've abused it. And so because I granted it, I can rescind that power. And so the people of the states have that authority. And the meaning of those powers, the enumerated powers in Article 1, Section 8, were defined by the people of the states at the time of ratification. So, yes, what we've seen is an expansive projection of those powers. People in Congress don't even know what those what those words are anymore. They, they talk about things like the good and welfare clause. Now, I have searched high and low in the Constitution. I've never found the good and welfare clause ever. I, Where's that? Uh, you know, the good and welfare clause. Is that a Pelosiism or a Mexican? No, it was, it was Conyers of Georgia, right? So Conyers was saying, we, uh, it's a, we can do it because of the good and welfare clause. Where's that? Conyers is, is, <laughs> has been in office forever, hasn't he? Yes. These guys, well, you, they, never, they never get unelected. Or it was, it's not just the Democrats. Um, several years ago, there was a town hall meeting in New Jersey, and they, Lobiondo was representative there. And, and somebody stood up and said, Representative Lobiondo, what does Article 1, Section 1 say? And he said, um, oh, you mean that, that says Congress shall make no law? No, no. What does Article 1, Section 1 say? And it's, of course, that, that sets up the legislative branch. He didn't even know. It's, right. that's, <laughs> Chuck Schumer was on CNN a few years ago, and he said the three branches of government, the, present, the president, the House, and the Senate. 
<laughs> no mention of right. the judiciary whatsoever. Right. So these people are just completely oblivious to their yeah. to, to the Constitution themselves. So how can you expect? This is to your point. How can you expect? people to follow the Constitution when they don't even know what's in it. And they've never probably cracked one book about the ratification. I mean, they might have glanced over the Federalist essays and they think they know about the Constitution. Well, because Madison and Jay and Hamilton said it. But there's volumes and volumes of these ratification debates. And uh, you rarely even had these things presented in a court, federal court. You know, this is what the ratifiers said it would mean. Uh, you did have it. Uh, Luther Martin actually brought it up in one case, but um, that was in the 19th century. So h- how can we expect these people right. to follow something? They don't even know what's in it. Uh, it's it's well, a shame. Yeah. But 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 apart from Congress, I, I, I wager that a significant perhaps minority of the U.S. population would say the Constitution has no bearing on what we're doing here and, and we ought to right. disregard it. Well, that raises, it raises an interesting point because if we're talking about the effectiveness of the Constitution, I mean constitutions are only as good as the people they purport to govern. If I mean, Justice Scalia liked to say the Soviet Constitution protected all kinds of liberties, but no, you know, if the operative norms and values of the people are not liberty friendly, then the Constitution is just going to be a piece of paper. It's not going to uh, it's not right. going to be able to check um, power grabs and 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 uh, unjust um, government control. So uh, really, it's it's a cultural thing. In that sense, it, there are all, institutions always seem to follow culture. And if you don't have uh, a general cultural understanding or civic literacy, you are going to lose the institutions that that okay. follow from that. That's my opinion. Well, speaking of constitutional literacy, Brian, I'd like to ask you about this democracy scam. Uh, we, it, it never goes away. I heard Biden, of all people, bloviating the other day about our democracy. I suspect he's gearing up to run against Trump in in three years. Um, the word is not contained in the Constitution. It's not contained in the Declaration of Independence. The in the in the uh, our, our, some of our founders warned against it um, in the Federalist Papers. In the Constitution, it actually talks about a Republican form of government. I, why are we saddled endlessly from, I guess, grade school civics on with this idea that the, the U.S. federal system is a, is a democracy? Because it feels good, right? It's, it's a nice, oh, it's, all, it's equal. We're all equal. We can all vote. We all take part in the system. I think that it comes down to feelings. You know, it's emotivism. Um, and that's a very dangerous thing. Uh, but I think that's that's the basis of it. And I remember years ago, I was talking to my grandfather about this, and he, he accused me of not being believing in democracy. And <laughs> I said, well, I, I really don't in many cases. And oh, you know, he was a Midwesterner, and uh, he grew up in you know, World War II generation. He just he couldn't believe that. Uh, he said, Yeah, I can't I can't see how you don't believe in democracy. And uh, but when you look at what's – you're exactly right. The structure of the federal government was never designed to be democratic. In fact, they designed it purposely not to be democratic. You have the Electoral College. You have the Senate, which were elected by the state legislatures. So you have this system in place where the people don't have a whole lot of control over the government itself. They do at the state level though. So I think the founding generation did believe in democracy uh, at, at a more localized level and what they could do with that there because they were protecting communities and the, and the culture of a community. But they didn't want Massachusetts governing South Carolina or vice versa. The people of Massachusetts, if you look at the ratifying convention in 1788, they were very concerned that these slaveholders in the South, these people that were not like them, would have any control over their government in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. And they were promised, you're, you're just foolish. There's, there's no way these people in South Carolina are going to control you. And the same thing was happening – uh, in the South. So uh, that's where we have to get these terms right. What we have is a federal republic. It's not a republic. It's not a singular republic like France. It's a federal republic. We have we have 50 republics. And in those republics, you can have more democratic systems. And that's fine if that's what the people want there. But if you look at, say, Virginia in, 17, in, in the 1780s, it was very undemocratic. And uh, Charles Sidnor wrote a great book on this. And he pointed out that Virginia, so undemocratic, had more concern for civil liberties than any other state that had more democracy. Um, so we have this belief that democracy is going to be this panacea. It's going to save all our liberties. It really doesn't. In fact, what you find over time is that more democracy often leads to less civil liberty than more. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, But you have to believe in this concept of civil liberty and, and protecting that. And, what, and also in the founding generation, we have to understand there were different conceptions of liberty. I mean, you had mm-hmm. – 
You had the Celts that were very much individual liberty. You had the, the Quakers, which were reciprocal liberty. If I say you need freedom of speech, well, then I'm gonna, I, de- I demand that you give that to me as well. You had the Puritans, which believed in this kind of community liberty, which is, you know, Franklin Roosevelt's the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, where these, you know, as long as the community was safe, then we didn't care if we trampled all over civil liberty. Uh, and then you had the Virginians, which very much believed in what was called, uh, you know, David Hackett Fisher called hegemonic liberty, the liberty from the top down. But that top down liberty would actually protect the people below them, too, in the common law tradition, as if the if the center passed something that was unconstitutional to the people in that county, they would just ignore it. I mean, that's nullification. And so uh, that's something we have to understand when you brought up common law before. We are playing two different ball games. Oftentimes, we've got one team playing football on this field and one team playing baseball on this field, and we're trying to make these things work, and they often don't. In a federal structure, they can't because the people playing uh, you know, football and the common law tradition can make that work at the state while we have restrained on the, on the center. So uh, we have to start thinking in these terms, and it's, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're fighting you. We're going way uphill in this case, but um, I think we can. We're making headway uh, slowly but surely. Well, let's touch on the First Amendment. It's under fire. Uh, hate crimes laws are being considered. Hate speech laws are being considered. Is the First Amendment still something that separates us from, from the rest of the West? Is it, does it protect us? Do we still have a, a deg- relative degree of free speech in the U.S.? I think so. Uh, I think that we haven't gone as far as – I mean there are some European countries um, that are very controlling on speech and hate speech and certain types of speech. And, uh, and we have not gone that direction. We have not drifted that far. Um, so you know, the, I mean the First Amendment is a, is a big animal. There are a lot of different moving parts to the First Amendment. Um, but, uh, but I think you – know, I think – Again, it goes back to this idea of the culture. If we if we stop valuing freedom of speech for what it is and why we have it, um, then we will risk losing it because institutions do tend to follow. Um, and uh, you know, who knows? Obama's appointees to the federal courts are just they're just all terrible, and they're mm-hmm. um, they really don't know a whole lot about constitutional law and I say that with you know without any irony um, intended I I really mean that and they are the types that look as uh, look at things like empathy as a guiding principle of jurisprudence that can control decisions and cases and if you have a lot of of federal judges populating the the federal judiciary that think like that that really disregard the document that they swear an oath to uphold then you might see some weird tinkering with with First Amendment. You might see some weird precedents coming out. And, uh, you know, Obama remade some conservative circuits, the the 11th Circuit, the 4th mm-hmm. Circuit. I mean, I'm, I might get in trouble for saying this, but he, you know, he, he really, um, he really did a, uh, did a number on our federal judiciary and, and, and populating it with people that, um, in my view, don't really have a, a very strong understanding of a the Constitution, Western jurisprudence, Anglo-American legal tradition, common law tradition. They just sort of um, know a lot about feelings, and you know they know about a lot about American history from say the 1960s forward. But for them, the 1960s the was counts, the founding yeah. era for them in, in yeah. Ameri- American history. Um, so maybe I'll get in trouble for saying that, but it's a, you know, it's you, something you'll get I, in I trouble for believe. expressing your opinion. Yeah. I mean, well, I it doesn't mean, sound like not, free speech. <laughs> well, not, not, not from the government trouble, but, uh, you know, well, we're all the government now. Alex. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, let me, let me make a couple of points about this. First of all, I think free speech in America has never been better in some ways. We're here on this Mises podcast and we're talking, I mean, this would have been, this would not that's have been true. possible 30 or 40 years ago to do this. And all the people are going to listen to this. I mean, you have people putting on podcasts now and all over the internet, we have so much free speech. And, and if we were talking about before we started recording, how, how, you know, how annoying that can get at times, uh, because your, your Facebook feed seems to be all these, poli- and like, gosh, somebody talk about their babies, right? It's, uh, mm-hmm. you know, instead of, uh, you know, all this stuff. But um, I, so I think free speech has never been better. And plus, we have to understand that every state constitution has a First Amendment, right? So my free... Is that the case? Every state yes. has some form? Yes. Every state has some form of protection for freedom of speech. So my first line of defense is actually the state constitution of Alabama, where I can say, look, the state of Alabama cannot abridge my freedom of speech, nor can the general government because of the First Amendment. But, um, you know, so when we look at this concept, I think in some ways free speech has never been better. 
Um, and I think that, uh, you know, overall, uh, I don't think we're losing it. I mean, I do think that you you have the federal courts that could that could come in and, and create some problems. But the other dirty little secret about the federal court system is Congress could abolish the Eleventh Circuit if they wanted That's to. That's true. Congress That's could abolish true. the Fourth Circuit. They Strip could just say, you know what, abolishes. take all these courts out. And in fact, uh, I think Newt Gingrich of all people made this point one time when mm-hmm. we were complaining about you know one of these circuits. He said, well, look, Congress can just get rid of it. Of course, they're not going to. But if we had enough people that knew that, and everyone complains, well, the courts, the federal courts are out of control. Well, just take t- Section 25 of the Judiciary Act out and then strip the – take out some of these circuits. Just say you federal judges no longer have a job. Go find – go work at McDonald's, right, because that's about you – know, <laughs> that's about all you're worth, right? So uh, go there and do that. But they could do this, and if enough people understood that – and I, I made this point uh, – I think it was on uh, – gosh, what radio – it was on uh, Dr. Um, – what's the guy name out? And he used to be on the uh, – uh, Oh, gosh, I can't remember his name. But anyways, I brought this up to him. He has a big program out in California. And uh, he said, I've never heard that before. I've never heard someone say that you can just get rid of the federal courts. People think the federal courts right. are created yeah. and they're just there forever for, in perpetuity. We're going to have these federal courts and they're just going to rule on high. The Congress could take all of that out. That's true. Uh, that so Ninth Circuit would be yes, a, a the good Ninth starting could place. Just <laughs> go away if we wanted it to. And so if people understood that, the courts would not be as abusive as they are because there will be some fear. If we, if, we go, if we start making these decisions that are so obnoxious, the Congress will just cut us out. Uh, and that would be great. Uh, and actually make the Supreme Court judges ride the circuit again. They, they yeah. don't do that oh, anymore. I, yeah. I, if, you, if, you, uh, uh, if you made the Supreme Court and it, was, it were required to be in the city of the lowest population and the state of the lowest population, meaning it had to change locations, the justices couldn't wear robes. They had to ride circuit. They had to write an opinion in every single case. You, you <laughs> would, you would get a change to Supreme Court for sure. But to your opinion about the freedom of speech, that that really is a good point because, um, you know, we like to to glorify uh, the founding generation and often rightly so. But you think about the Alien and Sedition Acts. We yes, don't have we have nothing like that now. Right. And and mm-hmm. uh, so we, we maybe you know there are a lot of things we do take well, for granted. You, you point out the Sedition Act. One thing that was actually pointed out when that was passed is that no, this law is unconstitutional for the federal government. But there was actually points made. Well, this is what we want. Just let the states pass it. Because yeah. the state of North Carolina could pass this if they wanted to. Sure. They, can, they can pass this additional law. Massachusetts can pass one if they want. But the federal government cannot. And that was the whole point about that argument. This law is unconstitutional at the federal level. It's not unconstitutional at the state level. This is an abuse of power by the general government. And we're just not going to enforce that law in our state. So with Virginia and Kentucky. Um, so the states have a lot more leeway. But again, my, my civil liberties are first protected by my state constitution. And I bring this up with gun rights advocates all the time, too. I know we're going to talk about that. But you know, your, your first line of defense is going to be your state constitution. If you don't like that, well, then amend your state constitution and make it stronger. Um, don't always appeal to the center because you're going to get disappointed. If the Supreme Court today says everyone can carry a firearm, next year they could say everyone can't carry a firearm. You're, you're mm. putting your, your liberties in the hands of nine people. And that's dangerous. So um, I think that this is, you know, when you look at freedom of speech, it, it's it's so much better than it ever has been because of things like this. Well, let's elaborate on the Second Amendment and the state of it. There's not a lot of Second Amendment jurisprudence, by the way. Uh, but we were talking off camera about how, in, in your view, there's this misconception that the Second Amendment, in effect, federalized gun rights and gun laws. And so uh, California can't really have uh, more restrictive gun laws than Alabama. So give us your take on the Second Amendment. I think they could. First of all, the Second Amendment was put in the Constitution because of Article 1, Section 8. Article 1, Section 8 very clearly says the general government can arm and discipline the militia. So the fear was during the ratification debates, well, if we can arm the militia, then we can disarm the militia. So that's why the Second Amendment, if you look at some of the original drafts of the Second Amendment, uh, they were much more elaborate than what we got um, and much more detailed. But the Second Amendment was there to ensure that if the general government is going to arm the militia, which they actually did in 1792, they said every man has to have a musket, a certain amount of powder, a certain amount of ammunition, then they can't say you can't have these particular firearms. But the states at the time, some of them did have more restrictive laws. Pennsylvania, for example, did. So the idea was that the general government cannot disarm you. But if the state of Alabama wants to say you can't carry this particular firearm, then you can't. Uh, mm-hmm. My position has always been if the general, the general government can't even tell me I can't own a tank or an F-16 fighter jet. I mean, they can't tell me that. But the state of Alabama could. They could say you can't have a tank on <laughs> – you can't drive a tank to work, right? And, you know, so sometimes we'd want to on the interstate, you, but you can't drive a tank to work. So 
I, I think that this is the problem when you look at it's again, it's incorporation. When you look at that structure and you start saying, well, the center has to tell me what I have, that is at the whim of, of federal judges. And you don't want that. You want a protection somewhere else. And if uh, and if you if you have that at the state level already, then appeal to that. Alabama has a very strong, quote unquote, Second Amendment. So does uh, so does Georgia. So does Florida, all the states around here. Some states don't. Iowa does not. California can do what they want. Uh, the state of Illinois does not have a very strong Second Amendment. Um, so uh, you need to, to understand your first line of attack is at the state level. Don't appeal to the center. I believe all federal gun control legislation is unconstitutional. But on the other hand, uh, I, I think that the states can do what they want in that regard. So would you would you argue that at the time that the Constitution was signed, both the signers and the public would have would have thought the Second Amendment doesn't apply to states? Absolutely. I mean, there was that was actually Madison actually tried to have an amendment put into the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, which would have what we would call incorporate the Bill of Rights against the states. And he was rejected outright. Mm -hmm. And the first just take the First Amendment. If people believe that the First Amendment applied to the states, then you wouldn't have had three states at the time with state established churches. And they did after the Bill of Rights were ratified. They still had state established churches. So how does that apply to the states? <laughs> Uh, right. we, we talk about this idea, no prayer in public schools. You can't, you, can't, uh, you can't have a moment of silence. My gosh, we had daily Bible readings in public schools until the 1960s uh, and all through the 19th century. In fact, some states were prohibiting Catholics from, from uh, you know, serving as teachers. They, they didn't want Catholic Bibles in the schools. Well, if all that's unconstitutional, if all that flies in the face of the First Amendment, how are these states doing it? Because they understood it didn't apply to the states. The states could do these things, and we would look at that and say, well, that's bad, but that was the political community. And so you have to fight at that level first and foremost. Right. Well, look, as an ex-Californian, we, we beat up on California a lot. And I know <laughs> I get emails. There are plenty of libertarians and conservatives in California. But but it is true that the, the urban centers, uh, L.A., San Diego, San Francisco Bay Area in California are very left and very blue. Um, I, I mean, just at this time... I, Here's one thing I, I, I sometimes disagree with with other libertarians about it. it w would it be so terrible if if California s said you can't own you know X Y and Z guns here, X Y and Z magazines here, uh, and Alabama said, "Come on down, you can have an Uzi," and and uh, the minute you're a mile outside the city limits, you can shoot at hay bales all day long and drink moonshine while you're at it. Um, is that so awful? Why do why do libertarians insist on this universal perspective when when in fact, as a tactical or strategic measure, um, we might do better with a localism mentality? Yeah. Well, and you know, enabling that variety and diversity, letting people be sovereign in their own political communities, I think, is important. And one danger behind that tendency toward universalism is also a tendency toward coercion because once you start saying that we ought to universalize things what you're also right. saying is you're that there you know you're also presupposing some sort of coercive mechanism to make somebody else who is not in compliance therefore comply right. mm -hmm. and that is very problematic mm -hmm. well it also comes to comes back to bite you executive orders grow as a phenomenon throughout the 20th century and then someday trump is president you don't happen to like Trump. Uh, it's awfully hard to argue against executive orders, although hypocrisy mm -hmm. in politics has not yet been criminalized <laughs> in this country. Um, I, I'd like to wrap up this discussion with something that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I, I really believe that that vast social democratic welfare states, especially those that are multicultural, are a recipe for disaster and strife and, and maybe even civil war. And and I don't I don't like breezy talk about civil war and shooting each other. I think that's 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 very unlikely, and we ought to consider it unlikely. But um, I, I think the only thing that that might save uh, America from a shooting war at this point would be uh, a, a mindset of subsidiarity and localism and real federalism, as in, envisioned under the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, and the federal system itself. I, I, is there hope for this? I mean, with Trump as president, our our our, our friends on the left. Waking up, is, is there hope for real federalism again in this country? Well, I, I mean, I'd like to think so, but uh, my hope before uh, before we get to federalism on the national scale that it is now is a program of devolution and decentralization so that you have federalism at a smaller scope and scale 
I mean, I think that we talked about constitutions and whether they're successful. I think the the more localized a constitution is, the more likely it is to succeed. I mean, we have bylaws in companies that operate as constitutions. We have restrictive covenants in HOAs that operate as constitutions. And so far as I know, for the most part, people aren't going out and going to war over these things. I mean, people mm-hmm. understand if if I violate – uh, whatever bylaws of my church organization, then I'm either going to be excommunicated. I can go to some. I can go to church somewhere else, and you know, war doesn't break out. Feelings are hurt, all that kind of stuff. But uh, you don't have mass violence, um, and you certainly don't have the giant public sort of displays and uh, parades that we have with our sort of at this point farcical <laughs> political scene. Um, but uh, so, uh, you know, yes, I guess there's hope for it. And, and I just I would think that um, that federalism on a smaller scale would be uh, a, a better direction to move in. I think there's a lot of hope for it. And I, and I point to several things. In 1994, we would not be having this discussion uh, because no one was talking about federalism in 1994. I mean, you would have it. You would have people say, we're well, you know, the Federalist Society and we have you – know, but nobody really talked about real federalism. Mm-hmm. Here we are in 2017 and this is an active discussion that people are having all over the country in a variety of different ways. You've got a number of organizations that are pushing a federalist message, real federalism. You've got a number of educational is- institutions like Mises Institute pushing that kind of message. Um, so I think that – I have a lot of hope. You have you have you know hundreds of students that are going to come to the Mises University next week, and they're going to get a variety of different ideas, but they're also going to hear federalism. I, at some point, I'm sure it's going to be brought up, and this is what we need to think about. Um, you've got uh, the Tenth Amendment Center out in California. You've got you know, I'm familiar. I'm associated with the Abbeville Institute. We do that kind of stuff in you know smaller scale. Um, so. You've got a number of groups that are really talking about this. You have a, an active secession movement in California. I mean, that's right. that's made national news. So. Uh, that's great. People are actually waking up and saying, you know what? Maybe the problem is we can't have a top-down structure for everything. We can't say this is – it's my way or the highway because that creates a tremendous amount of political conflict. Maybe the better situation is saying, you know what? We're California and we're going to go our own way and we'll just – the people that don't like it can move out. They, and Texas will say, come on into Texas. And there's actually this this is going on right now. Le- leftist Texans are moving to California. And conservative t- uh, Californians are moving to Texas, a huge uh, migratory pattern that way. So I think people are waking up to this and saying, you know, we can't have – we can't govern 320 million people with 535 congressmen and a president and nine Supreme Court judges. It's just impossible. So can we do this in a better way? And I often point out to my students, you know, the state of Alabama today has as many people as the entire United States in 1790. And if in 1790 – we could have states that were much smaller function effectively. Why can't the state of Alabama do it itself? Why, why do we have to think we need 320 million people to have, a, to have a country? Why can't we have 4 million people? Why can't we have a million people or even 200,000 people? Uh, and you look around the world, you look at Switzerland and other – I mean these places that are much more decentralized and how much happier the people are. And we often talk about social democracies and people point out, yeah, but what about the Scandinavian countries? They're, they're happier. Well, they're much more homogenous. And, and, and so I think that when you start looking at these, at these mega states, they're coming apart because of all the stress and people are finally starting to say, you know, I want to have the community the way I want. And this is my – when I do my podcast, it's think locally, act locally. Stop thinking about the center instead of you know think globally, act locally. It's think locally, act locally. Act in your own community. Do the things that you think are due to preserve liberty and sweep around your own doorstep. That's a very southern tradition uh, and not worry about what everybody else does and uh, we'll, you know, we'll be better off for it. And these are great conversations and more people are having today than ever before. So I have hope. I mean that's the gist of it. I have hope that this is going to get better in the future. Well, as we finish, I would just encourage people to go look at the Swiss government website mm-hmm. and look at their explanation of federalism. That's a, that's a small country with less than 10 million people, and they can actually vote locally on things like immigration, whether to allow someone to stay, whether they're a good neighbor. Um, with that, I think we've taken too much of your time already. Brian McClanahan, thank you so thank much. You. Alan Mendenhall, thank you so much. Thank we'll you. post both your Twitter feeds so you can find out more about these gentlemen and their most recent books. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.